Don't you love to hear about the love of God? Don't you love to sing about his mercy, his grace, his compassion? But what about the other side of God? What about his holiness? What about his righteousness? What about his righteous indignation and anger? What about his judgment of sin? Do you like to hear about that? Oh, beloved, if you want the truth about God, you have to get the whole picture. We'll do that today. Come to that oracle regarding Babylon. We have seen the demise of Babylon. We have seen how eventually Babylon will be a haunt for jackals. It will be their houses will not be filled with people. It will be filled with owls. It will be totally devastated and ruined. We've seen that. We have seen that God in his mercy and in his grace has brought Israel to a time of rest where now Israel is the one that is having the world wait on them rather than being slaves and captives and, and, and the offscouring of, of the earth. We have come to this time and now in Isaiah, a taunt is taken up. Now that the earth is at rest, now that things are at peace, a taunt is taken up about the king of Babylon. And as we look at that, so to speak, funeral dirge, that song that is sung about him, those words that are proclaimed, we get a glimpse into the holiness of God, into the righteousness of God, into the ultimate triumph of God. Let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 14. Now remember he's talking about the king of Babylon. And there are people that have taught that this is a prophecy about Satan. And they have taught that it is a prophecy about Satan. And I've got to tell you something I did too. Until I really looked at it in the context of all of Isaiah. So many times we go to a chapter and we read something and it sounds like another passage and we put them together, but we've ripped it out of its context. Here is a taunt about the king of Babylon. And when it comes down to verse 12 and it's talking about him and you're marking the text, it says how you, the king of Babylon, have fallen from heaven O star of the morning, O son of the dawn, you have been cut down to earth, you who weakened the nations. We think of it as Satan. And yet when we keep reading and we take it in its context, it says, is this the man, verse uh, 16, the middle of the verse, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? No, here is a man that is being judged by God. This is not Satan. This is not the fallen angel, but this is a man, now listen, that has exalted himself against God. It goes on to say, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. In other words, I'll be my own God. I'll be like God. I don't need a God. Now, when you look at Isaiah chapter 13 and 14, you want to read it in conjunction with Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51. This is the word of the Lord concerning Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans through Jeremiah the prophet. And it says, declare and proclaim among the nations, proclaim it and lift up a standard. It says, do not conceal it, but say, Babylon has been captured. Bel has been put to shame. Marduk has been shattered. Those are their gods. Her images have been put to shame. Her idols have been shattered for a nation has come up against her out of the north. 
It will make her land an object of horror, and there will be no more inhabitant in it. Both man and beast have wandered off. They have gone away. Now, that just so resonates with you if you have studied and observed Isaiah chapter 13 and 14. But now, next to Isaiah 14, verse 13, where it says, You have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Write Jeremiah 51 and verse 53. And let's look at Jeremiah 51, 53, because both these chapters, like Isaiah 13 and 14, have to do with uh, Babylon. And so in verse 53, it says this, though Babylon should ascend to the heavens and though she should fortify her lofty strongholds, he says, from me, destroyers will come to her. In other words, they're ascending to the heavens. They're exalting themselves above God. You can't do that and get away with it. Babylon can't do it and get away with it. No nation can do it and get away with it. And listen to me, no individual, no matter how low you may see yourself on the, on the uh, rung of humanity that you haven't attained very much and no one would notice you, God notices you. And so we come in Isaiah chapter 14. Let's go back. And this is what he says in verse 16, those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, is this the man that made the earth tremble? Is this the one that shook up everything? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world like a wilderness? Is this the man? I mean, just stop and think about that. I, I love history, and I, I didn't love history until I became a Christian. And then I saw, hey, history is his story. It's God's story. It's God moving through the nations and moving through time, taking us to this ultimate day of the Lord when eventually he will set up his kingdom. But as I look at it and as I study it, I look at Hitler what was that man? He was a nobody. He was a loser. And yet this man, who in a sense belonged to the devil, this man took control of brilliant Germany and overpowered them. Look at the history of Russia. Look at Lenin. Look at Marx. Look at these people. Look at Idi Amin. Look at, at these horrible, horrible people that in a sense made their lands tremble, who made the world a wilderness, who overthrew its cities, who did not allow its prisoners to go home. Read some of the stories of, of some of those Russians that were sent to Siberia and that were not allowed to go home. Look at the cruelty. Look at the cruelty of Hitler when he knows the war is lost and yet he wants to kill all those Jews. It says, all the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. I mean, you can go to the Vatican and you can see this glorious, these glorious, glorious tombs of the, of the popes. You can go to countries and you can see where the bones, so to speak, are the tombs of these mighty kings. And he says, but you have been cast out of your tomb. You don't even have a tomb on the earth like a rejected branch, clothed with the slain who are pierced with the sword, who go down to the stones of pit, of the pit like a trampled corpse. Corpse, you will not be united with them in burial because you have ruined your country. You have slain your people. May the offspring of evildoers not be mentioned forever. Prepare for his sons, the king of Babylon's sons, a place of slaughter because of the iniquity of their fathers. They must not arise and take possession of the earth and fill the face of the world with cities. You see, this is what they did in the first day of Babel. When God came down and confused their language, God had told them to scatter and they said, oh no, we will build for ourselves a city. 
We will build for ourselves a tower whose top reaches into the heavens. We will be like the Most High. And he says, you will be brought down to the earth. And he says, prepare for his sons a place of slaughter because of the iniquity of their fathers. They must not arise and take possession of the earth and fill the face of the world with cities. And this is what he says. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts, and will cut off from Babylon name and survivors, offspring and posterity. In other words, Babylon is going to be totally, absolutely obliterated, obliterated. There's not going to be one survivor because God does not want that iniquity to continue. What is he saying here? He is saying, now listen, go back to verse 7. As they take up the taunt against the king of Babylon, who has died and who has gone to Sheol, the whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. This is what it's going to be like when the Lord deals with the wicked of this earth and when God sets up his kingdom. He says in verse 23, I will make Babylon a possession for the hedgehog and swamps of water, and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. He's just going to take that broom of destruction and he is going to sweep through Babylon. He's going to get rid of them all. And yet, you know what? He gets rid of them all, but they continue to live. They continue to live. They continue to live either in Hades or in heaven. These are people that did not even believe in him. Remember the question at the beginning of the week? What if I don't believe? Then does that mean I escape what this Bible has to say because I simply don't believe in God? Oh, no. There is no escape from God. If you take the winds of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, he's there. If you say darkness shall cover me, even the night will be light about you. There is no hiding from God. He searches it out. We'll talk about it more in just a minute. Well, the taunt against the king of Babylon has come to an end. But I don't want us to leave it right away because I want us to see that there is a place called Sheol. I want us to see and be convinced in our mind that the Sheol is, is a place that is referred to in the New Testament as Hades, a place of the dead, a permanent place. Now listen, a permanent place until we come to the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. And then this present heavens and this present earth will be renovated by fire, so to speak. And there will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth. And in between that, there will be a great white throne judgment. And at that time, death and Hades will be delivered over to be judged. You really need to understand this. And this is a wonderful time and opportunity for us to see this. So what I want you to do is I want you to go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Now, as we turn there, I want you to know that Luke 16 is not a parable. It is not a story that Jesus made up that has one central point that he wants to get across. Luke 16 does not carry the characteristics of a parable. Rather, Luke 16 is a true account. It is an insight that Jesus gives to you and to me and to all who will read his word of what happens when we die. 
So follow me very carefully. In Luke 16, verse 19, it says, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. Are you going through bad things right now? If you know Jesus, precious one, hang on. The good is going to come. It says, but now he's being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over here from here to you will not be able and that none may cross from over there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that you may warn them, listen carefully, so that they will not come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear him. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Repent means to have a change of mind. But he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. In other words, if they won't take God at his word, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, you and I are studying one of the prophets. We're studying Isaiah and I keep thinking, Lord, will they stay in there with me? Will they hang in there with me? Can I expect from television a group of people, a remnant of people that, that really are serious about God and serious about knowing him? Thank you for being part of that group. Now, what is he telling us? Well, what I want to do is I want to come on our timeline, our straight line, and I want to put a cross that cross representing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Luke, what Jesus is describing in Luke is a place that existed before Jesus died on that cross. It had two parts. It had Abraham's bosom, and it had a part where they were in flames and torment. You could not cross over. You just read it because there was a great gulf fixed. In other words, once you died, you went to this place. And it says, and it calls it the place of Hades. And so it is referred to as Hades, a synonymous term with Sheol, which is what we have read in uh, Isaiah. And this is where the good go and the evil go. And they go to this place according to the way that we have lived. It's our lifestyle that shows our faith or lack of faith. Now, after Jesus Christ dies on the cross and pays for the sins of mankind, is buried and then uh, uh, is raised from the dead, then he is called the firstborn from the dead. He is called the first fruits of the resurrection. Remember, he turns to the man on the cross that says, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And he says, in this day, you will be with me in paradise. Why? He has believed. 
And so what we see is that after Jesus Christ dies, then Jesus leads captivity captive. He takes those people out of the side of Abraham's bosom and takes them to heaven. So that now Paul writes in Philippians and in Corinthians that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He says that is far better. So what happens is you have one side of Sheol, one side of Hades vacated. But where do the lost go now? who have not believed in Jesus Christ, who die without receiving him, they go to the hot side. And there they stay until Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And this is what it says in Revelation chapter 20. In verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in them, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. You're going to learn more about it in the book of Isaiah. But I want to close with one word of promise one word of assurance, and that is what the Lord of hosts says in Isaiah 14, verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand. To break Assyria in my land, and I will trample him on my mountains. Then his yoke will be removed from them and his burden from their shoulders. This is the plan devised against the whole earth. So he says, I have taken care of Assyria. I just told you how I'm taking care of Babylon. This is the plan devised against the whole earth. This is the hand that is stretched out against all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? He is God. You better bow the knee and believe in him. Well, beloved, it's been quite a week, hasn't it? Quite a week. And we've come to these final moments when we look at God's precepts for life. What is his precept for life for you and me? It is the assurance that he is sovereign. It is the assurance that he has a plan. It is the assurance that what God has purposed, no man can stop. It is the assurance that there is not one nation on the face of this earth that can escape what God wants or escape his judgment. It is the assurance, beloved, that God is righteous and that he will judge the world in righteousness and this iniquity that you see people getting away with that is so absolutely frustrating will be dealt with. The Lord has his arm outstretched and no one can stop it. It is God's arm. And what is his precept for life for you? It is to remember this is the God that you belong to. This is the God that has enfolded you and brought you into his family. This is the God that has given you the gift of eternal life in his son. This is the God that has said to you, you will never taste the second death. Why? Because you have believed in the one who died for you when you were a sinner, who paid for your sins in full. And the minute that you believed, you passed from death to life, from the power of Satan into the glorious kingdom of Almighty God. You are going to live forever and ever and ever, and it will not be in Sheol. It will not be in Hades. It will be in heaven. 
we will know one another. We will recognize one another. In his presence will be fullness of joy. At his right hand, there will be pleasures forevermore. There will be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. He will wipe away all the tears from your eyes and the former things will not be remembered. Some of you battle with the failures of your life. Hey, forget them now because he's forgetting them then. So why carry that burden now? There is a brand new beginning because he is God. And as he is purposed, so it shall come to pass. What he has planned is going to stand because he's God. And you can call him Abba. Thank you for watching today. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more Precepts for Life.